At Pepperdine, you'll not only see policy differently, you'll see your future differently from here too. I'm Pete Peterson, Dean of Pepperdine School of Public Policy, welcoming you here to tonight's first ever Patricia Taliaferri Dean's Distinguished Lecture with renowned historian Dr. Neil Ferguson. The Patricia Taliaferri Dean's Distinguished Lecture welcomes thinkers and leaders to Malibu to discuss the elements of effective public leadership that are often difficult to quantify. Those found through the study of the liberal arts. In this, the series is a perfect extension of our graduate program itself, which uniquely balances both quantitative and qualitative coursework in preparing public leaders. It is both ironic and appropriate that the series is named for Patricia, a woman who often avoided the limelight. She now has a public speaking series named for her. But Patricia was also a woman of firm and well-informed convictions who supported the unique mission of SPP. It was Patricia who, as her son Michael told me recently, was the connecting point between the Talia Ferry family and Pepperdine. First, it was her support of her husband Gus as he earned his president's and key executive's MBA in the 1970s. This was followed by her encouragement of her son and daughter as they attended and graduated from Seaver College and advanced degrees. In very real ways, we are all here tonight because of Patricia. We are joined tonight by Gus Taliaferri, who made tonight possible through his vision for this lecture and his gracious gift. With him here are his son Michael, daughter Karen, and brother Ed. Let's thank Gus and his family. Been a while getting here, Gus, but it's great to be here with you tonight. Thank you. As we approach our 20th anniversary this coming fall, some of you know I've taken on my own historical research into the founding of the School of Public Policy, sifting through hundreds of pages of meeting notes and memos and strategic plans. I came across this speech text from another one of the world's great historians, the late Kevin Starr. It was Professor Starr, who passed away in January, was on the school's founding and initial faculty. I saw Kevin last summer up in the Bay Area, and he told me again how much he enjoyed his time here at Pepperdine. Almost exactly 20 years ago, in a speech prior to the school's opening, Starr reflected on what made Pepperdine unique among America's graduate programs. He said this, and I quote, because Pepperdine remains anchored in values, it can communicate itself to the region as seeking not just numbers and statistics, not just fancy formulations, but value in our public life, by which I mean both religious and philosophic value, the philosophia perennis, the perennial philosophy, and the Judeo-Christian tradition which has shaped our civilization. It is only rarely that academic discourse directly refers to these values, yet they remain implicit in what is being said and thought. Public policy at Pepperdine, in other words, without being overly self-conscious about it, can conduct its investigations and engage in its debates solidly anchored in a philosophy that sees individuals as free moral agents, not as victims in some academic scenario." Unquote. We remain committed to Starr's vision, shared by our other founders, like the late James Q. Wilson, Dean Emeritus Jim Wilburn, who is here tonight, and past university president David Davenport, to encourage our students and future public leaders to, quote, conduct investigations and engage in its debates solidly anchored in a philosophy that sees individuals as free moral agents. Few areas of the social sciences can help us understand these debates better than history. And that's why tonight we are so fortunate to be joined by one of the world's foremost historians who will help us to consider anew the Philosophia Perennis. Dr. Neil Ferguson is a senior fellow both of the Hoover Institution 
and the Center for European Studies at Harvard. He is the author of no less than 14 books, and I hear a 15th is on the way, including Paper and Iron, Hamburg Business and German Politics, The Pity of War, Explaining World War I, and the recent Kissinger, 1923 to 1969, The Idealist. Dr. Ferguson has worked in other media, producing award-winning television series for PBS and UK channels, Channel 4, on subjects ranging from American history to Chinese history. Please join me in welcoming our first Patricia Taliaferri, Dean's Distinguished Lecturer, Dr. Neil Ferguson. Well, thank you very much indeed, Dean. And let me just say what a great honor it is uh, to be here uh, giving a lecture named after Patricia Taliaferri, and a pleasure to meet the members of her family who are here tonight. It's also a thrill to be at, at Pepperdine, uh, a campus uh, so beautiful that even Oxford man can feel a certain <laughs> pang of envy, and I do not say that lightly. I am going to spend about half an hour uh, talking about what it is that I do. Because what I do is to apply history. And I'm going to show you how I try to do that by applying history to some very recent events. Now, we're in California, and I know that for some people, the events of the night of November the 8th, 2016, were traumatic. <laughs> uh, having just moved to Stanford, I was a little surprised to receive an email on the morning of the 9th offering me counselling. <laughs> if you needed counselling, don't worry, I'm not going to trigger you. Um, <laughs> the way my five-year-old son repeatedly triggered me and my wife uh, earlier in 2016 when we still lived in Massachusetts. Uh, Thomas discovered that if he shouted to uh, Donald Trump for president, Donald Trump for president in restaurants, he <laughs> embarrassed his parents <laughs> enormously successfully. <laughs> but he was prescient uh, in his adoption uh, of Donald Trump back in March of of last year. Some of you will remember this famous television ad. It was the ad morning in America that ran in Ronald Reagan's campaign for re-election uh, for a second term as President of the United States. And I think for some people at least who voted for Donald Trump the possibility uh, existed and still exists that it may be once again at morning in America. Not everybody shares that view. The alternative view, which you can read every day in the New York Times or the Washington Post, <laughs> or you can watch it on CNN if you prefer, is that this is twilight in America. Something truly dreadful has happened, and uh, Donald Trump is far from being the heir of Ronald Reagan. If you want to, you can visit a counterfactual America, uh, a fascist America, by reading either of these two great novels. If you read uh, Sinclair Lewis's It Can't Happen Here, which was written uh, in the 1930s, you're transported to an America in which a bombastic demagogue, Buzz Windrip, has been elected president and proceeds with extraordinary speed uh, to dismantle the US Constitution and create a regime similar in almost all respects to that of Hitler's Germany. Philip Roth, uh, many years later in the 
uh, uh, early 2000s, uh, wrote a, a new version of the same idea in The Plot Against America. If you haven't read these novels, I urge you to do it. Apart from anything else, it will give you a yardstick, a way of measuring how exactly the Trump administration is doing. Since 3 a.m. on November the 9th, 2016, a great many historians and journalists have been of the view that the Sinclair Lewis uh, Philip Roth scenario is upon us. Only this time, it's not fiction. Now, I have a good deal of respect for Tim Snyder. Uh, the Yale historian. But I don't have any respect for this new book of his on tyranny. This flyer arrived in the mail for me. 20 lessons uh, from the 20th century it offered. Don't be a bystander. It's a very short book and I read it with mounting indignation. What made me so annoyed was the casual way in which Snyder drew analogies between our predicament in the United States in 2017 and the predicament of Germans in the 1930s and other Europeans uh, under dictatorships in the mid 20th century. The reason this annoyed me was that it made no attempt to point out the multiple differences between those two historical situations. And that is how not to do applied history. If you deliberately omit the differences and present only the similarities, you are, in fact, engaged in a kind of intellectual fraud. Andrew Sullivan is a dear friend of mine. We were at Oxford together many years ago. But when he wrote this article in New York magazine, America has never been so ripe for tyranny, I felt really quite cross. I felt cross because it seemed to me that to argue that the election of Donald Trump presaged some kind of collapse of the republic was irresponsible. And it must be said that very little, if anything, that has happened since uh, November the 9th has borne out this thesis. <coughs> I've spent a good deal of my career studying interwar Germany. My doctoral thesis was about the Weimar Republic. Let me tell you, ladies and gentlemen, there are very, very few resemblances between the United States today and Germany in 1933. And anybody who tells you differently is kidding you. Shortly after Hitler's uh, election victory in January 1933, in all the major German cities, there were torchlit parades of brown-shirted members of the Sturmabteilung, the SA. There was a great deal of violence against opponents of the Nazi party. And from that moment on, it was perfectly clear that the constitutional order of the Weimar Republic was going to be subverted by a mixture of violence and pseudo-legal change. It may or may not have escaped your notice, but almost the first thing that happened in the Trump presidency was that the president's executive orders on immigration were struck down, not even by the Supreme Court, and that this decision was accepted by the administration, which went back to the drawing board, only to have its revised executive order on immigration struck down again. If you think that's what it was like in Germany in 1933, <laughs> then I don't know what it is that you're smoking, but it's not legal on this campus. So let me offer what I would call some real applied history. 
instead of the wild fantasies that currently seem to be de rigueur amongst liberal intellectuals uh, on the East Coast. Let's first remind ourselves how very close this election result was. By my calculations, if just under 39,000 people had voted differently in three states, the result would have been different, and Hillary Clinton would now be president. Notice also the significance of these wonderful maps that appeared in the New York Times. If one's trying to understand what happened last year, a part of what happened was the separation politically of small town and rural America, Trump land, uh, which covers about 85% of the land surface of the United States if you just add together all the counties that voted for Trump. And on the other side, the Clinton archipelago, all those densely populated liberal islands that strongly voted uh, for Hillary Clinton. So this doesn't seem to me to be uh, the obvious prelude to a massive regime change. Uh, quite the reverse. The second point I want to make to you is that if one is going to engage in historical analogy, which is a, an activity I strongly believe in, then you should use the right analogy. Donald Trump is a populist. There are many populists in the world today. Some of them have similar hairstyles to him. <laughs> I think of my fellow Oxonian, Boris Johnson, who is a kind of old Etonian version of Donald Trump. Or Hilt Wilders, the Dutch populist who also favors big hair. <laughs> Populism is different from fascism. A distinctive feature of the fascist regimes of the interwar period was their military style. They wore uniforms. They did domestic violence in a systematic way, and the most aggressive of them did war. The primary goal of Adolf Hitler's regime was war. Rearmament was its economic policy. The goal of rearmament was to undo the post-First World War settlement. That's not what populism is about. Populists aren't really into war. You'll have noticed that Trump disavowed the Iraq war, claimed never to have said a word in favor of it. The only kind of war that populists are up for, really, is trade war. And that's a different kind of war from actual war. Let me uh, offer you a better analogy than the it's 1933 in Germany analogy. After the 1873 financial crisis, the United States was struck by a wave of populism, a backlash against free trade, against, against immigration, against corrupt financial elites. In California, a man named Dennis Kearney came to the fore, whose slogan was, uh, the Chinese must go. Now, Kearney didn't advocate literally building a wall because you didn't need to do that to prevent the Chinese from coming to California. But in this cartoon here from the period, you'll see a metaphorical wall being built across San Francisco Harbor. And the le legal equivalent of this uh, was the 1882 Exclusion Act, which effectively ended Chinese immigration to the United States. Populism has a history in the United States in a way that fascism doesn't. Populists have succeeded before in the United States by saying to disgruntled voters, your problems will be solved if we limit immigration, limit free trade, and crack down on the corrupt financial elites who have benefited from open economic policies. To understand why so many people in states other than California voted for Donald Trump is not in fact difficult. If you look, for example, at median household income adjusted uh, for inflation, 
and this chart takes you all the way back to the 1960s, you can see that from 1999 onwards, the average family in the United States did significantly worse in real terms than families in America were used to doing. We haven't even regained the 1999 number uh, according to the most recent data. For many American families, the period since this century began has been a bumpy round trip economically in which the financial crisis produced one of the biggest shocks in modern American economic history. If you want to see another reason why people were dissatisfied with the status quo, look at the prime age male labour force participation rate. The key thing here in this chart is the comparative perspective. Compare the United States with any other major developed country, including France or the United Kingdom or Germany. The United States is worse. Labour force participation amongst prime age males has declined further here than in other comparably developed countries. Thirdly, and perhaps most extraordinarily, we have witnessed in recent years, and again this is the time frame from the 1990s until now, an extraordinary phenomenon, a really major deterioration in the health of middle-aged white Americans. Uh, Angus Deaton has done a couple of remarkable papers on this, and uh, you can see a couple of charts from his work here showing that whereas equivalent demographic groups' mortality rates have been declining in developed countries, for white, uh, middle-aged Americans, the mortality rate has gone up. And the reason it's gone up, you can see on the right-hand side, is that there's been an epidemic of substance abuse and outright suicide. Looking at these data, it is, I think, clear that something is rotten in the heart of America. And the votes for Trump were, I believe, in part, an expression of frustration with the political elite in Washington that simply did not seem to care. My good friend Charles Murray wrote an extraordinarily prescient book, uh, Coming Apart, uh, which foresaw, I think, the political consequences of this kind of sociological crisis in the American heartland. When you consider the problems of middle America in these terms, then Trump's message it seems to me makes a great deal more sense. What were the core points that Trump wanted to communicate to voters last year? That he was going to boost the economy. And he would do it not just by renegotiating trade agreements, though that was certainly a big part of the campaign, but also through tax reform and deregulation. So there was an economic component addressed to those parts of the country that had manifestly suffered economic hard times. And on foreign policy, it's clear that far from being a fascist, Trump is a realist. Even calling him an isolationist seems to me completely misleading. It is the right of all nations to put their own interests first, quote unquote. Trump said in his foreign policy speeches that he, ha he wanted nothing to do with the legacy of the uh, George W. Bush administration. There would be no imposing American democracy at the point of a gun. The only real exception to this rule of minimal engagement was his pledge to, quote, eradicate radical Islamic terrorism completely from the face of the earth. Guess what? Many ordinary Americans, confronted with atrocities like San Bernardino and Orlando, took the view that this was a very good idea indeed. And I must honestly say that on that issue, I agreed with them 100%. Let's be clear. The problem of the Trump presidency is not his tyrannical power. It is his relative weakness.
And let me try to explain the ways in which I think that Donald Trump is relatively weak. First of all, he starts as the most unpopular president since polls began. Not only does he start there, but it gets steadily worse with every passing week. The first 100 days are not quite going according to the Adolf Hitler script, to put it mildly. In a completely conventional democratic way, Donald Trump is struggling with falling approval ratings because the public discerns that it's not going well. And last week was just the latest illustration of the problem. Donald Trump does not have to worry about Madonna uh, or any of the other showbiz types uh, who appeared to grandstand on the Women's March just after his inauguration. He has to worry about the Republican Party, a party which does not feel particular loyalty to him and which, in its own terms, lacks the kind of discipline that you would be used to seeing if, like me, you'd grown up in the United Kingdom where the Conservative Party would not have made as uh, extraordinary a mess of health care reform uh, that the Republican Party made uh, last week. Between Paul Ryan's difficulty in marshalling the House uh, Republicans and John McCain's deep antipathy uh, towards the President, Donald Trump has a problem. Thirdly, when you've promised to double the economic growth rate, at least, and the economy does this, it is a little awkward. There's a huge gap between the confidence data that have been telling us since November the 9th that business is filled with hope at the prospect uh, of a Trump presidency, and the actual data of what business does in terms of investment, say. Now, I think it's quite possible that uh, now that tax reform rather than healthcare reform is on the agenda, and now that deregulation is getting underway, this will change. It is quite possible that we have passed peak anti-Trump. I'd even go so far as to say I think peak anti-Trump was last week. And that with tax reform and deregulation, things will begin to look a good deal better. But at this point, Donald Trump is up against a headwind. My old boss Larry Summers calls it secular stagnation. This is not Ronald Reagan's economy. Reagan was coming out of an inflationary period. The labour market looked very different then. Donald Trump's challenge is he's coming out of a deflationary period with a labour market that looks a great deal less healthy. His fourth, and this is the final uh, problem I'll talk about, his fourth problem uh, is that the Chinese are right about protectionism. If you told me even five years ago that the President of the United States would be an avowed protectionist and the President of the People's Republic of China would go to the World Economic Forum at Davos and defend free trade, I would have assumed that you had had too much to drink. But this is what happened uh, in January and Xi Jinping's speech at Davos was a rather masterly move on the part of the Chinese to step into the role of custodian of the international open economic order. I was told that a German minister had to be restrained from giving him a standing ovation on the occasion <laughs> of that speech. Right at the beginning of this year, I told uh, a number of audiences uh, that what would happen would be that the art of the deal would meet the house of cards and the house of cards would win. I think that is roughly uh, what has happened. And that is why I think most of the commentary uh, that we read in the New York Times uh, and the Washington Post or here on CNN has been so completely wide of the mark. So convinced have people traumatized by last year's uh, election result become 
that Donald Trump is a tyrant, that they fail to see that exactly the opposite is in fact the case. That at this point, uh, Mr. Trump looks like a relatively weak president who is uh, facing some very major obstacles to political success. Now, what I've done in trying to set this new political era in perspective is to apply history. And I'm going to take uh, a few moments before I invite you to ask me difficult questions to explain what I mean by the term applied history. One of my heroes is an Oxford philosopher of history, R.G. Collingwood, whose autobiography was published just before the outbreak of World War II. Everyone should read this book. True historical problems, Collingwood said, arise out of practical problems. We study history in order to see more clearly into the situation in which we are called upon to act. Hence, the plane on which ultimately all problems arise is the plane of real life. That to which they are referred for their solution is history. For generations, Americans have hoped that social science or political science or systems analysis or something like that would give them answers to the problems they confronted. This is the United States of amnesia. The last thing anybody wants to do in Washington is apply history. It's almost as if people who enter government take an oath to wipe from their memories anything they might know about previous problems similar to the ones that they confront. This is not new. As I was writing the first volume of my two-volume biography of Henry Kissinger, I was very struck by the fact that Kissinger made the same observation in the 1960s. Kissinger was a very rare thing in post-1945 America. He was a, an intellectual who believed that history could be applied to contemporary problems. While his contemporaries were studying economics and political science, Kissinger studied the Congress of Vienna, 19th century diplomatic history. People wondered what this earnest young German-Jewish uh, refugee was doing studying Prince Metternich in the age of nuclear arms. Kissinger had an answer. History teaches by analogy, he said, not identity. No significant conclusions are possible in the study of foreign affairs without an awareness of the historical context, because history is the memory of states. Europeans, living on a continent covered with ruins testifying to the fallibility of human foresight, feel in their bones that history is more complicated than systems analysis. Amen. tragedy, ladies and gentlemen, is that applied history of the sort that I am talking about isn't being taught in American colleges nearly enough. If you look at the decline of diplomatic history or legal and constitutional history, even economic history, the discipline in which my career began, it's really very striking. Uh, this data takes the story back uh, to the 1970s, uh, you can guess the kinds of history that have been growing while these fields have been declining. In the University of Texas, you can see what I'm talking about in the extraordinary proportions uh, of readings that are assigned to students, divided here by topic emphasis. Social history with racial or ethnic emphasis comes in a clear first. Try finding military history in this chart. I want to suggest that the historical profession in the academy has got its priorities 
badly wrong. That the shift, which was in some ways justified to gender history, has gone too far to the point that it is almost impossible now to study military history at any major university. Let me explain why uh, this is such a problem. History is being studied less and less. The aggregate number of bachelor's level majors reported in 2014-2015 uh, to the American Historical Association was 19%, nearly a fifth down on 2009. I understand the latest data from Harvard are absolutely catastrophic, and I'd love to claim the credit for that. I'd like to say it was because I left, <laughs> but I wouldn't be surprised if the same was going on at Stanford too. It is, it seems to me, a dire state of affairs when one cannot, at Harvard or Stanford, find a single course offered by the history departments on the American Revolution, on the American Civil War. When I was reflecting on this, I carried out a simple exercise. I thought of what I would call the 20 most important subjects that a historian should know about. You might say how very subjective of you, but I didn't rely just on my own uh, instincts. I assessed importance by the number of times these subjects were referred to in the New York Times, an impeccably liberal journal. These 20 topics, which ranged from the Reformation through the Enlightenment to the World Wars by way of the American Revolution, these 20 topics in 1966 were comprehensively covered by the Harvard History Department. In fact, they were overcovered. You could have taken 27 courses in the 1966 fall semester that would have covered these 20. How many do you think in the fall of 2016 were covered? The answer is five. Something is rotten not only in the state of middle America, something is rotten in the state of the historical profession. And the falling enrollments reflect our failure as academics to address the kinds of question that interest our students. The sorts of question that Collingwood was talking about when he said that our role as historians is to address the practical questions of our time. The problems of our time, we should refer to history for answers. Studying history for its own sake is antiquarianism. If that is what we engage in with endless courses on the mysteries of antebellum Alabama, 1843 to 1848, to give an example of the kind of course one might encounter these days, then we should not be surprised if the elites who make decisions in the future, whether in government or business, are historically completely ignorant. Their historical ignorance will be our achievement. Let me conclude. While historians were failing, one man, Lin-Manuel Miranda, was succeeding. The musical Hamilton, which I highly recommend to you, is in many ways a masterpiece of applied history. It addresses a whole series of contemporary questions, not least the question uh, of identity, in the context of the formative events of the American Revolution. It has sparked an extraordinarily healthy revival of interest in Alexander Hamilton, who was, like Donald Trump, half Scottish. <laughs> Excited by the musical's success, I went back to Hamilton's correspondence, and I found from 1795 a wonderfully insightful remark. It is only to consult the history of nations. Notice, that was the method of the founding fathers. To consult the history of nations. To perceive, wrote Hamilton, that every country at all times is cursed by the existence of men who, actuated by an irregular ambition, 
scruple nothing which they imagine will contribute to their own advancement and importance. In republics, fawning or turbulent demagogues, worshipping still the idle power wherever placed, and trafficking in the weaknesses, vices, frailties or prejudices of the people. The Founding Fathers applied history. They knew from ancient and modern history that the biggest threat a republic faced would be from a demagogue. And they designed their constitution for precisely that eventuality, separating the powers between the executive branch, the legislature, and the judiciary to ensure that no demagogue could ever turn the United States into a tyranny. Anybody who seriously applied history to the events of 2016 would have realized what would happen when a demagogue was elected president of the United States. Not that a tyranny would suddenly be proclaimed, but rather that the wisdom of the founding fathers would be vindicated and the separation of powers a perfect example of applied history would work. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, sir. Okay, we're gonna have a couple microphones going around. We have uh, a good 15 minutes or so for questions. Uh, do we have questions? Gentleman, that. Right, hold on. Pete, don't you have students to do the roving mics? <laughs> I was going to say, this is, this is leading from the front. Yes, sir. Uh, thank you very much for your wonderful talk. I have a question about the Founding Fathers and the separation of um, the judiciary. And well, the one thing that seems to me that the Founding Fathers did not consider when that you had a subversion, when you had a collusion based on technology, where you know you can have a cognitive dissonance where the shutting down of free speech is liberalism, and where you have a sort of 1984 uh, scenario, because of course those uh, uh, factors didn't exist in 1790. Could you comment on that? Because I think there is a greater distress on democracy from the alt-left than the alt-right. I'm inclined to agree with you. After all, who were the violent demonstrators in the wake of the election? There were no Trump-supporting brand shirts that I could see, but there was a lunatic fringe of students running amok in Berkeley and in other campuses. Moreover, when one looks at the way Charles Murray was treated at Middlebury just the other day, uh, when physical violence was used to prevent him from, from speaking, one realises the irony that the left that denounces Donald Trump and accuses him of fascism is itself guilty of fascism, is itself engaged in closing down free speech. They'll be burning books soon enough. And this is the central paradox of our modern political discourse. That those people who call themselves liberals in this country are not the liberals in the strict sense of the term at all. They aren't the friends of liberty. On the contrary, their liberalism seems to be some reincarnation of the totalitarianism of the mid-20th century. Let me add one more point. You raise the issue of technology, and I think that's very important. If one thing is radically different in 2017 from 1777, uh, it's surely the technology. And we are, I think, still coming to terms with the dramatic impact on our society of social networks uh, and indeed the internet. The book that I'm writing at the moment is addressing this precise question and asking if Ultimately, by empowering social networks, we've created a kind of monster, something that we can't control. The irony there is that the people who created the social networks, the people who own 
companies like Google and Facebook were strongly committed to the democratic side in the 2016 election. How they must suffer when they reflect on the role that their creation played in propelling Donald Trump uh, to the presidency. There is no doubt in my mind that in the absence of the internet, and specifically in the absence of the likes of Facebook, Donald Trump would not have been able uh, to win that election. In a conventional election, based on conventional fundraising and television adver advertising, he would have been crushed. The social networks invented in Silicon Valley by people who considered themselves the embodiment of liberalism were, oh, rich irony, the keys to Republican victory. The thing I love about history is that it's full of ironies like that. <laughs> it was once said that the only law in history is the law of unintended consequences, and that's a perfect illustration. Questions? Other questions? Yeah, there's one there, and I've spotted a gentleman at the back too. Sorry. I don't think I can do it without a microphone. Um, wait for one for the people. Oh, okay, I shall wait for one. Um, I found it interesting that the Freedom Caucus is playing such a role. It reminds me rather of the House of Commons at this point, you know, uh, with the arguing that goes back and forth and less like our Congress. But, uh, that said, and then also I'm sure the Silicon Valley guys are laughing all the way to the bank with their billions of dollars, uh, whether it's Trump wins or Hillary wins or anything else. Uh, but executive orders are something that I'm uh, a little bit concerned about. Because the business community seeks stability, if nothing else. And within each regime, if there's these dramatic shifts with executive orders, um, that seems to be undermining, you know, kind of the, you know, the stability of the overall system. Because you know, if Trump doesn't win the next time around and a progressive wins, then all the things he did will just be undone, and back will be the Obama things. And you know, the business community just gets whipsawed around within this whole dynamic. And I'm wondering what your thoughts are, if any, on that. I agree with uh, your view that the business community hates uncertainty above all else. And it's almost uh, certainly the reason that investment hasn't followed the confidence uh, indices upwards. Uh, people are quite reasonably waiting to see what actually comes out of Congress in the form of legislation. Of course, let's not forget which president started using executive orders to circumvent Congress. Uh, it was President Obama. Some of us said at the time that this was the kind of tool that would come back uh, and be used against his, uh, his own achievements, and, and so it's proved. The good news is that these executive orders are still fundamentally not ukazes or imperial decrees. They can be struck down by the law courts, and in many ways they illustrate the limits of the power of the executive branch. I think it would be very desirable to, to use them less. And yet that's not the biggest problem of the federal government. The biggest problem was actually referred to by Steve Bannon, known as the Prince of Darkness in the liberal media, when he referred at the uh, APAC conference to the administrative state. The administrative state is an important concept. Uh, my dear old friend Chris DeMuth has written a brilliant article about this uh, explaining what it was that went wrong circa 1970 when the executive branch started to create one agency after another with extensive bureaucratic power to generate regulations. This began with the EPA, but soon there were any number of such agencies. I think the total number at the moment is north of 60. DeMuth argues that it was Congress's decision to give away its power to pass the buck on politically difficult decisions to the bureaucracy that led to the rise of the administrative state. But the problem is that the thing is now completely out of control. No presidency has produced more regulation than the Obama presidency. And almost every presidency has produced more regulation except for one. The one exception was Ronald Reagan's presidency, which successfully reduced regulation on business. I'm more worried about the executive branch's agencies and their regulations than I am about executive orders because the regulations are far more numerous. Just keeping track of the Dodd-Frank regulations was an almost impossible task. If you were in the finance sector, 
the main area of growth in uh, your business was compliance, as you had to hire ever more lawyers and, uh, and the like to deal with this incredibly complex edifice that was emanating from Washington. My view is that this is bad in more ways than one. Now, one extremely important way in which it's bad is that the more complex our regulatory system becomes, the more unstable it becomes. We don't just have uncertainty to worry about, we have a very powerful version of the law of unintended consequences. In a book called The Ascent of Money, which I published just as the financial crisis was beginning, I warned that excessively complex regulation was the disease of which it pretended to be the cure. And that the more complex we made the financial system, the more crisis prone it was likely to become. That, I think, still stands. And if you ask me, do I think the world's financial system is more stable today than it was 10 years ago, thanks to all the new regulation? I would say almost certainly not. If anything, it's probably slightly more fragile because of its increased complexity. So if at the end of the four-year term, something has been done to rein in the administrative state, something has been done to roll back the burden of regulation, which falls most heavily on small business, not on big business, then I think the Trump presidency will look very different. And I, I have not given up hope that something of the Reagan era survives in the DNA of the Republican Party, and that with tax reform and regulatory reform, we will actually get to mourning in America again. I still hang on to that hope. Do have any student questions? Students? Bob, you are an older student. But, yeah. We're all students. Uh, like you just graduated from Strauss, a lifelong student. Yes, please. Uh, thank you for a great talk. I have a question, and, and I guess a quarrel with one of your recent pieces, Applying History. In November, you published a stimulating piece in the National Interest, uh, arguing for spheres of influence derived from Theodore Roosevelt's approach to international relations. I don't get that. I, I get that if you accept Henry Kissinger's rendition of Theodore Roosevelt in diplomacy, you could get there, but Theodore Roosevelt actually stood for the opposite propositions, early entry into World War I, total victory and alliance with NATO, um, akin to NATO. In many ways, Theodore Roosevelt, I think, is better understood as almost an incipient neoconservative. Isn't there a danger uh, in um, invoking history that there are competing interpretations of it? And especially in Kissinger's case, though he's an effective advocate, we have to be very careful about accepting a historical interpretation uh, as authoritative without rigorous analysis. Well, of course, part of what makes history difficult and, uh, and worth studying is that there are multiple interpretations of all the great questions and all the great historical figures. When I was uh, writing a piece uh, last year with Graham Allison about how the, uh, the next president should apply history more effectively, we, we recommended the creation of a, a council of historical advisors uh, so that more than one voice would be heard on these issues. But let me address the piece that you've uh, mentioned, which was a, an unusual piece. Perhaps that wasn't uh, obvious. The point of that piece was, in fact, uh, that it was a memorandum to the new administration designed to convey to them uh, what seemed to me and Kissinger to be a viable grand strategy that was compatible with their campaign commitments. Uh, its publication in the American interest was kind of a byproduct of the effort. My view was and it is that uh, the Trump administration could do itself uh, a self-inflicted harm if it embarks on a collision course with China. And the key point of the piece was to argue strongly against that approach and to advocate, in, advocate instead an improvement of the relationship uh, with China. And the central theme of the piece was that if you thought about it, 
an opportunity had presented itself for the United States to align itself with the other permanent members of the UN Security Council. That is to say, Russia, China, uh, Britain, and conceivably France. So that was really the key argument of the piece. The conclusion about uh, Teddy Roosevelt was based entirely on the Kissinger account in diplomacy. Uh, there was no effort on my part to consider alternative interpretations because that would have not served my purpose very well. And that's a, an illustration of uh, what happens when applied history enters the realm of power. In order to make the argument that the Trump administration should pursue a Kissingerian strategy uh, and not the more confrontational strategy that Steve Bannon for one was recommending. I had, to, I had to make an historical argument that Roosevelt's uh, a preferable role model to Andrew Jackson. But it had to be Kissinger's Roosevelt. The piece was in effect a co-authored piece trying to convey a Kissingerian message to a new administration. I haven't given up hope, by the way, that that message has been heard. I've just been in China for a week. The Chinese are naturally apprehensive about what will happen when uh, President Xi Jinping goes to Mar-a-Lago. This is like a kind of reverse of Nixon in China, isn't it? Uh, <laughs> Xi Jinping in Florida. Uh, and maybe there'll be an opera about that too. <laughs> maybe Lin-Manuel Miranda can write it. But. If the Trump administration had remained consistently anti-Chinese, as it appeared it might when Trump took the Taiwan call, uh, if it had continued to talk in terms of uh, trade war or even confrontation in the South China Sea, uh, then I don't think the Chinese would have accepted the invitation. The reality is that that anti-Chinese uh, strategy has uh, significantly uh, faded from uh, the Trump administration's rhetoric. And I wouldn't be at all surprised if in the course of this year a great deal gets done between uh, President Trump and President Xi. And if that's the case, then my article, my memorandum, will have at least contributed something to a good outcome. Um, are we still looking for, still the, looking a, for, a, a, for a student? There, right, one has the microphone. The I, there is another faculty member who has a question, but he'll, he'll be patient. Yes. Can you hear me? Oh. So as you were talking about, um, as you're talking about Donald Trump and populism, I was reminded about uh, some historical reading or just a recent academic, like for example Francis Fukuyama, who discusses the end of history and that there's a natural trajectory uh, towards liberal democracy, and that's a natural end state. Uh, but as we we're discussing populism, it seems as if like we've hit perhaps like a peak or perhaps a turning point where there isn't necessarily an end point towards liberal democracy for every country. But even for those who are on the trajectory. Well, of course, as an historian, I'm against the end of history. <laughs> Be out of a job, wouldn't I? Francis Fukuyama's become a near neighbor of mine on the Stanford campus, and I've long admired his work. Uh, the End of History was a brilliant essay. If you think back to its publication in the summer of 1989, uh, it was uh, visionary. Uh, very few people in the summer of 1989 foresaw that the Berlin Wall would come down that November. Uh, I can remember trying to write an article that summer in a British newspaper predicting that the Berlin Wall was crumbling and the editor refused to run it because uh, he thought I'd been listening to too many Ronald Reagan speeches. That was what he actually said. <laughs> so Fukuyama's piece got printed um, and it reads very well today. Uh, the book reads uh, even better that that was published after the wall had fallen. Interestingly, the book mentions Donald Trump in a passage in which uh, Fukuyama is reflecting on the possibility of a kind of po politics of celebrity. So I think 
many people refer to, to Fukuyama's end of history having read only the title, uh, the, the, which is a very common practice, uh, actually. I, I find many people refer to my works uh, having read only the title, and uh, it should really be uh, a criminal offence to comment on a book when you've only read the title. But anyway, the, the Fukuyama uh, argument, um, I think, in, in its caricature form, was that we were all converging on a sort of liberal democracy plus market economy, in, in the book, there are lots of caveats about that scenario, just as Sam Huntington's Clash of Civilizations had lots of caveats about how that might pan out. You've got to give these men their due. These were the seminal essays of the post-Cold War era, and every week you see public intellectuals trying to match that feat. It's incredibly difficult to nail it like that. What I think we now confront is a a more complex future than your question implies. Because it's not just a choice between liberal and illiberal democracy. Uh, there's actually a range of, of different options on the table. The, the thing that I'm most struck by at the moment is the extent to which all the 190 or so states in the world are, as states per se, being weakened by the proliferation of, uh, of networks. And while they appear to continue functioning in the traditional way, some more or less legal than others, actually the power of the state itself is being challenged. And you can see the big states responding in different ways. The Europeans have one approach, the Chinese another, the United States still another. But for me, the real challenge of the 21st century will be how institutions that were designed 100 years ago or more than 200 years ago in the case of the United States cope with the creation of, of networks larger and faster than anything we've ever seen before. New political communities are being created, and old institutions are dying. Political parties suddenly go extinct. One of the big stories of our time is the death of social democracy. It's happened to the Labour Party in Britain, in the Netherlands. I wouldn't be at all surprised if it happened to the Democratic Party in the United States next. What happens is that the intelligentsia goes out this way, sort of... Elizabeth Warren direction, and what's left of the working class goes this way in search of, of populist leadership. So the extent of institutional dissolution is really quite extraordinary, and it will be a very brave uh, political scientist who, who, who writes a Fukuyama-esque essay about what comes next. I'm not sure that uh, elections will ever be the same again. Uh, since the advent of, uh, of Facebook and Twitter. And I'm not sure politics will ever be the same again since we ended up with a, a candidate who was both a celebrity and an oligarch, a brand uh, and a business. This is new territory, and I don't think the Fukuyama terms of reference actually capture it. Time for one more question. In your book, Civilization, the West and the Rest, you discuss, which I read more than the title, you discuss, <laughs> Thank you, sir. You discuss how competition is a, was a major factor in the rise of the Western powers over the major, much larger countries in the East. Um, and when you were, uh, were responding to the Kissinger question a minute ago, you discussed how you believe the United States should partner itself more in the UN which is a network which abrogates power of states because it takes down competition in some arguments, uh, but how we should utilize the UN to partner more with these large countries, which in my mind would take down competition. What would you say in response to that? Well, I think one has to be a little careful here in one's terms. In civilization, the argument I made was that economic and political competition became legitimate in Western Europe at a time when they really weren't legitimate in the great oriental uh, empires. Sort of default setting in the oriental 
uh, empires was that there should really be one unitary power, the power of the, the empire. And the notion of a market economy with competing corporations was entirely a foreign one. I think in the realm of international relations, it's a slightly different uh, conceptual framework you need to apply. In my argument in that essay that's been referenced, my point was not that the United States should wholeheartedly commit itself to the principles of collective security as enshrined in the UN, but rather that it should take advantage of the fact that by sheer chance, the five permanent members of the UN Security Council could make common cause for the first time almost in that institution's history. But I would say they would make common cause in pursuing their national interests. If one thinks about what it is that threatens the established great powers, uh, one of the things that threatens them is uh, nuclear proliferation. Another thing that threatens them is Islamic extremism. Uh, it's quite clear that there is common ground between the United States, uh, Russia and China on these issues. Uh, and that, that should be the kind of way we think about uh, the grand strategy uh, of, the, of the Trump administration. The UN Security Council is a really odd institution. It, it just privileges the, the powers that were on top in 1945. And accidentally, the Chinese are there, really, because it was uh, another Roosevelt's idea that they should be. Almost immediately, there was a revolution in China, and it meant that there was another communist power in the UN Security Council. That wasn't the plan. Uh, it was supposed to be Chiang Kai-shek's seat. And the United States has never really been able to satisfactorily use the United Nations Security Council because, in effect, the Russians and the Chinese nearly always exercised a veto power. Even since all the change that we've seen in the world, uh, that's still kind of the pattern. The Chinese tend to vote with the Russians for no very good reason, it seems to me. So this is not to say, let's embrace the UN. I don't want John Bolton to hear that I've gone <laughs> off the rails. No, no, my argument has always been that we should instrumentalize the UN. Just a couple of times it's really served the interests of the United States well. The Korean War and the first Gulf War. Uh, and, and that was because the Russians didn't show up to exercise their veto. <laughs> Let me make one final point. If there's one thing that hangs around Donald Trump's neck like an albatross right now, it's his relationship with Vladimir Putin. Multiple investigations go on. The Washington Post says, follow the money. He's already lost one national security advisor on the issue. It is unquestionably uh, a major uh, weakness of the presidency that this uh, cloud of suspicion hangs over the campaign's relationship with Putin. My view is that if some good were to come of the relationship with Russia, then many of us would be prepared to take a somewhat more constructive view of the matter. My great problem with it is that at this point it seems an entirely useless bromance. Uh, if you're going to have a bromance with the mafioso, which is really what Vladimir Putin is, you have to have some good reason for it. If the relationship with Russia could deliver peace in the Middle East, could end the war in Syria and stabilize Iraq, then I think I'd take a much more benign view of what happened. And, and so there again there's an argument for some grand strategy, make some use of this relationship, and then you may possibly be able to justify it. Now, I feel sure we've overrun our time, but... We, I, in, in Ode to Seaver, we have one more question. This is the one more, one more question. <laughs> Thank you for your, uh, for your talk today. Thank you, uh, Dean Peterson, for allowing me this last question. Um, I'm, I teach history. I agree with everything uh, that you said, um, teaching by analogy. Uh, and the value of history for analogy, and is Donald Trump Andrew Jackson? Is he Oliver Cromwell? Uh, how do we map him? What I'm concerned about, and this is my, my question, the graph that frightened me most was the graph of um, declining median incomes in the United States. Um, and so my question is actually about things for which there might not be historical precedent. Uh, and what I'm talking about in general would be a, a global economic plateau effect. And that the United States economy is, is not, no longer growing, it 
four or five percent. It's growing at one percent. China's economy, economic growth has declined from whatever it was to a, a much smaller number. Um, those things concern me. Uh, I'm also concerned about, and so there's statistical, there's statistical evidence for that. It's, it's demonstrable. These other things get into the realm of kind of forecasting, um, but things, basically robots. Uh, the, the possibility of, and there is historical analogy for this, an industrial revolution displaces farmers, they have to find other work, et cetera, et cetera. Uh, so there are historical analogies, but things that I hear about drones delivering pizzas. Well then what happens to the millions of 17 year olds who used to find summer work delivering pizzas? or self-driving trucks, self-driving cars, what happens to cabbies, what happens to truckers. Um, these are the kinds of things, I'm just curious since you uh, marshaled this evidence, this is not a, a question to um, uh, contest the use of history, but in thinking about the future, are, do I have a reason to be worried? Yeah. One, one last way that I've heard it put, the end of work. There's actual conversation these days about this, potential phenomenon called the end of work. Yes. Um, and no, so I've been looking forward to it for years. Here's the last way looking forward to it tonight actually. Here's the last way that I'll I'll phrase this question. What happens to America when the American dream stops? So Which these are graph these are great questions. Um, and it, it's an actually a good point at which to conclude because many people are, are worried when they read that artificial intelligence is going to render the human race redundant. I frequently hear it said by the grand uh, figures of Silicon Valley that the only real question to be decided is what level of basic income to pay the poor unemployed masses once deep mind has taken over the entire economy including Pepperdine faculty jobs like yours. And I say in a weary sort of way, look uh, I know you chaps are awfully clever, but um, people have been saying this stuff about technological innovation for about 200 years, uh, slightly more in fact. And the problem with this uh, argument is that it's always been wrong. Uh, pe people said that mechanization of the textile industry would create mass unemployment. Uh, and, and the argument began then, at the very beginning of the Industrial Revolution. And at every stage in this endless debate, uh, the pessimists have been wrong and the gains in income from technological innovation have created new demands which only human beings were in fact able to meet. John Maynard Keynes wrote an essay uh, in the 1930s asking if uh, uh, future generations would have nothing to do uh, if uh, by now we'd all be unemployed and uh, spending our time reading and practicing our, our tennis. But th that hasn't happened either. So I, I think if one applies economic history rather than the kind of uh, technological determinism that's so fashionable uh, in Silicon Valley, one arrives at the conclusion that large-scale labor-saving technology does not render the human race redundant. It simply creates new activities that human beings can productively engage in and relieves us from drudgery. Will there be structural uh, transition and, and uh, unemployment in the process? Yes, there always is. Uh, one can't simply redeploy people from being Uber drivers to working in uh, in geriatric care centers any more than one could deploy people from automobile factories uh, easily into other sectors in the 1980s and 1990s. So I think the economic history here is actually a source of relative optimism. Um, one could of course uh, go on at great length on this subject <laughs> and create even more work for oneself <laughs> Uh, keeping the audience here long past the promised end time, but that would be a mistake. Uh, and so uh, in the interests of letting us all uh, go and have a drink,
even if it is a non-alcoholic one on this <laughs> campus, I will say thank you very much indeed. because nights like tonight don't happen without a few things happening. Uh, first is a group of people taking care of all the logistics in putting this together. And so first and foremost, I want to thank my assistant and communications coordinator, Melissa Espinosa, who I think is outside. Uh, I want to thank Christina Ramirez, who is our director of communications, who got the word out to the community and to others. Um, for those of you who this is your first School of Public Policy event, I want to make sure that you know that we don't always have nights like tonight, but we always have provocative conversations here in the Wilburn Auditorium and in other places. So if you want to be on our mailing list going forward, uh, Matt Cutler is our Director of Advancement standing there in the back. Please make sure you touch base with him to give him your uh, contact or email information, we can make sure that you're uh, made aware of upcoming events here in Malibu. Uh, for those prospective students or those who are considering uh, America's most unique graduate policy education, uh, I ask you to be in touch with Carson Bruno, who's our Assistant Dean of uh, Admission and Program Relations over there. And uh, I want to conclude with the way we began by thanking the Talia Ferry family and especially you, Gus, for uh, kicking off what I think has been a, a tremendous beginning, a launch to what I know is going to be uh, a profound set of conversations here in the Wilburn Auditorium uh, in ways that continue uh, what makes this program unique, that we are educating policymakers to think historically. And I think one of the things that's been so great just in my brief uh, amount of time in getting to know Dr. Ferguson is that we've already agreed to begin to constitute a coalition of the willing of organizations and academics and scholars and public leaders that are really thinking very seriously about applied history and how, granted, there needs to be a quantitative understanding of public policy, but there also needs to be uh, this other side of understanding uh, the decisions that we all make, that we understand that we live in a particular time and in a particular place, and we're influenced as human beings by particular motivations. And so in this, we will continue uh, as America's unique graduate policy program. So we are adjourned, please. We have refreshments in the back, and again, as Dr. Ferguson said, they are not alcoholic, um, but we invite you to join us and Dr. Ferguson. Thank you very much for coming out tonight.